Hi, everybody. Welcome to VBF Facebook Live. It's Dr. Linda with this month's guest expert, Dr. Stuart Nelson from the Beckman Laser Institute. Today's topic is uh, laser treatments, when to begin, but we're also going to be accepting questions on uh, generic vascular birthmark questions. So let me know um, if you can see us. <laughs> we always like it when somebody hops on and says, yes, we're there, we can see you. Um, so let me just check. I'm going to just check to see mm -hmm. if it's live on here. Somebody joined. Somebody joined. Hi, Missy. Hi, Missy. So Missy's there. So we know that it's working. working. So this is good. Uh, let's see. I'm looking to see it pop up on my phone. And yes, I yes. see it. Awesome. Okay. So we have it there. Uh, Aaron Eskildsen just joined. Aaron, if you have a question. Um, Dr. Nelson is here with myself, and until we start seeing the questions, I just want to remind everybody that May is still the Vascular Birthmarks um, International Month of Awareness, so share your stories, um, post your pictures on our website with your, put on your birthmark if you haven't done that, and also um, we've had some discussions with some new things regarding Port Weinstein treatment. So Dr. Nelson and I have been talking about that with this whole new thing using ultrasounds to determine and Doppler's vessel depth. So you may be hearing about that in the near future. I see Carrie joined and uh, like to see your questions. Questions. We're not seeing any questions yet. Um, nope, I'm not seeing any. I see Missy joined. Nicole joined. So we're not seeing any questions. Are you seeing any questions, Missy? Because we're not seeing any. I just didn't know if um, we're not seeing them. So, oh, hello from Aaron. And Melissa just joined us. We're waiting for your questions. Since there are a lot of you that are joining right now, please submit your, hello, Melissa, submit your questions regarding um, the when to start treating, when to stop treating, how do you know you um, are getting a good treatment result? Hello, Nicole. So we, we have a lot of you on, <laughs> right? There's a bunch of people on 16 right now. So let's, hello, Tanya. Let's see your questions regarding the treatment of port wines and um, hemangiomas, basically any vascular lesion with a laser. Uh, Dr. Nelson also knows a lot about face syndrome and drug therapies that are being currently um, trialed for the with vascular birthmarks. All right, Michelle, thank you for being our pioneer tonight. Your daughter has a port wine. She's five. Is it too late to start treatment? No, it's never too late to start treatment. Ideally, you'd like to begin as young as possible because there are a number of optical advantages to the beginning of treatment five. earlier. Is it too but late uh, to start starting treatment? at five should no, be fine. It's never too late to start treatment. Okay, um, next question. I'm not seeing any. I'm not seeing any other questions. Oh, hi, my daughter has an AVM. We've been talking about those, Maria. You want to talk a little bit about that? I mean, we're, we're not seeing we're that question, Maria, so if you want to send us one. Oh, Carrie's saying, see you next week. Do you have your new laser yet? <laughs> hi, Carrie. Say hi to Jeremy. Looking forward uh, to seeing you guys next week. Uh, we've put the order in for the new uh, V-Beam Prima Laser, but the delivery date is probably going to be sometime in July. The uh, company is waiting to get their 510 pre-market approval from the FDA. That's what's holding it up. So Tanya says she's curious. Her daughter has had about 13 laser treatments. Is there a number where laser has no more effectiveness? No, I would encourage you and your treating physician to review your, med your daughter's medical record to see what pulse durations of the laser have been used. And often just changing the pulse duration of the laser exposure can help dramatically improve a port wine stain uh, that's been previously resistant. Thank you. Hi, Brooke and Maria. Um, so Melissa said her seven-month-old grandson has had his second full PDL. He has an appointment coming up next week, Thursday, first third. I see great results. It has lightened up quite a bit. Well, that's great. I don't know if she's saying you. Does that sound familiar? No, it doesn't sound familiar. Oh, but but good luck and yeah, keep going. Keep good going. luck and keep going. 
Um, Nikki wants to know any thoughts on the correlation between port wine and Chiari malformation. Actually, I just saw a patient about two or three weeks ago who had Arnold Chiari malformation. I mean, that's sort of, you know, it's a a malformation of the posterior brain. I mean, that's something you'd be more likely to expect with a hemangioma. No, actually, with some yeah. AVMs. Yeah, or AVMs, it. But and that's I'm not what that familiar may be. with port wine stains. Yeah. So, but I mean, maybe this again is a chance yeah. for you to say not all stains that we think are port wine may be yeah. port wine, right? Yeah. We've been talking about that. Um, Christine Chris Sausman, her son has Parks Weber cardiomyopathy, epilepsy, and an AVM. What's your opinion on treating a child? with multiple chronic conditions, and I'm assuming she means laser. Yeah. Well, I mean, certainly as long as those other medical conditions are controlled, there's no contraindication that to doing a laser. I mean, we do many children at our institution who've got, unfortunately, very severe Sturge-Weber syndrome, who have glaucoma, who have epileptic seizures and other medical issues. And as long as you're aware of those and they're properly managed, uh, we can put those children to sleep under anesthesia on an outpatient basis and do those procedures safely. Uh, Maria, oh, so now she's just said her daughter's AVM is a throat AVM. She has 13 different procedures, and, and now this has bled profusely. They are thinking of laser and bleomycin or alcohol. What is best? Well, that would depend on what uh, the imaging studies are. Unfortunately, I don't have, I don't know what the imaging studies are showing, whether how high flow this is, what location it is. Uh, unfortunately, that's a question that would be best asked to an interventional radiologist who's, think, who's considering doing the procedure. And there is a um, clinical trial coming out very soon, Maria, new drug therapies for ABM. So stay on the lookout to hear about that announced. And they will be talking about it in their conference in New York City in October on October 6th, and we still have some free rooms left. Tanya says, what are your feelings on other areas treating with the laser, like the hand, arm, neck? We do those. We do those in lots of kids. Um, we treat all areas of the body. Uh, the more distal uh, extremities are going to be more difficult as opposed to the proximal extremity. So a hand is going to require many more laser treatments as opposed to a forearm, which are going to require more than an upper arm or even the chest back. But certainly we do treat those patients, and we've got many infants with extremity lesions that we're now clearing because we're treating them so early. Yes, and that's our done-by-one philosophy. Carrie says, do you know how many new laser machines have been made? Hoping one comes to my area. Uh, to be honest, I don't. Everybody is trying to get their hands on, on the new Prima device. It's just a matter of Candela getting that approval uh, from the FDA so they can start doing the deliveries. Um, another mom, Kelly, she goes to Dr. G. They've had nine treatments. They're now in maintenance. They notice that it gets darker when it gets hot, Georgia, in the summer. Should we expect this, or is this a sign we should get more treatments? No, you should expect that. I mean, children and families will tell us that their child, depending on the ambient temperature of the room or the time or the time of the day, uh, the port wine stain can change colors. And certainly, uh, when you're going to be living in a hot, muggy environment, uh, your child is going to be vasodilating, and you're going to see that poor white stain get darker. So, no, I would just follow up with Roy, as you're currently doing. Amanda says, hi, from Reese Myers. Um, she's hi, Amanda. Patients. Nikki says her daughter's doctor uses an alexandrite, and it's damaged her eye. Is alexandrite? laser usually recommended for facial port wine? Well, you can use the alexandrite, and certainly we do. We don't use it as much in children. We use it more for, for purple hypertrophic lesions in adults. Uh, but certainly, the, that's an issue of eye protection. Unfortunately, the melanin in your child's iris will absorb the laser light. So I hope when the laser procedure was done, they properly put a metallic shield next to your child's orbit to protect it from the laser light. Um, well, they're coming in really quick. Jillian saying her two and a half year old has been on oral propranolol for eight months with significant results. Dr. Entea, who's great, he's in New Haven, suggests laser in the next year or so to reduce excess skin. Do you agree? Well, I, I probably would need to see a picture before I could comment on that. Certainly, the pulse dye laser will be helpful for any residual redness and telangiectatic matting. Uh, the fractional skin resurfacing can be very helpful to remodel the surface of the, of the skin if it's become thin and effaced. It can be helpful, but for just extra skin as a result of the hemangioma, that's probably not going to be helped with laser, if I've understood your question correctly. But if you could send Linda a photograph, you know, we'll have a look and uh, we'll get back to you. 
Um, so Kayla says her son is two months and a half. Oh, I just said that one. Yeah. Um, someone's going to Dr. Duarte. Good luck. Good luck. She's great. I um, Chelsea says she has a hemangioma turn 30. I've seen a doctor ages ago about laser, but never went through with it. Is there an age where laser treatments are no longer effective? Well, the first question is, if you're 30, I would be concerned that the diagnosis is correct. I mean, it's unusual for somebody who's 30 years old to still have complaints of a hemangioma. I mean, I would, you know, be concerned that perhaps you have a venous malformation, which has been misdiagnosed as hemangioma. Although with that said, I saw a 60-year-old woman about a month ago who came in who had the residual laxity in her skin as a result of her hemangioma. My nurse said, we've got a patient with a hemangioma, and I said, that's ridiculous. The woman's 60 years old. And no, she pulled out her, her uh, pictures of her, and she had a hemangioma when she was an infant. Wow. That's, so that's I would, cool. But I, if you're 30, I would make sure that that's not a venous malformation. Yep. So Christy says her son, and this is interesting, stinging heartbeat in his upper arm where his birth is. There's a lot of swelling and purple discoloration. Well, that, Linda, we were talking about earlier, I would be concerned your child has an arterial venous malformation and your child needs to have a magnetic resonance angiogram of the upper extremity. And find a good multidisciplinary vascular anomaly center where you are. You can email me and I can tell you the closest one. Jordan says, what are the best treatments? for port wine on the gums or inner ears? Well, the inner ears, it's difficult to get inside. You can have a port wine stand in the external auditory canal. Uh, for the gums, you have to be careful that you're not exposing on areas where there's the teeth. Uh, because if you treat the gum on the teeth bearing areas, you can actually infarct the blood supply to the tooth and the tooth will die. So you can certainly laser on the inside of the mouth, on the inside of the mouth, but you cannot be lasering in areas where there's teeth. Um, Kayla, I'm not sure what we said or what we answered. You'll have to go back and watch it because we don't remember what your questions are because there, there's 40, so many going 40 through. going okay. through. Um, Kelly's saying she's 48 and really Let's read the ones on the screen. This is too hard. To um, they're yeah. going by too fast. Yeah, and do you know how to pull these down? No, I don't. Okay, just, let's because, just, well, people have to be okay, because it's it um, getting hard. There are people thanking us. Okay. Um, Nikki said he did not use a shield. He said it wouldn't wouldn't have mattered because her skin is translucent. His theory was that her skin is so thin that it bounced off her occipital bone. Well, I, I wasn't there, Nikki, so I can't say, but the standard of care at the Beckman Laser mm -hmm. Institute and in most, in most institutions would have been that your child should have had a metallic contact lens placed into the orbit to protect, properly protect the eye when working on the face. Um, so Oritz, uh, um, calling in from Israel, emailing us hello, and he says it's 3 a.m. He was wondering what happens to the healthy skin that gets lasered. That it's is not going to be a problem. I okay. mean, it's often difficult uh, when you're doing these procedures to exactly delineate what the port wine stain area is because the skin gets red. So irradiating a, a nor some normal skin during the treatment isn't going to cause a problem. We treat normal skin all the time when we're treating patients with other vascular malformations or cosmetic procedures. So Christy says they see Dr. Mulligan and Fishman in Boston. It doesn't get any better than that. You're in excellent You're in hands. hands. Maria says we see Dr. Richter, another great one, but we do constant updates at the University of Michigan and wants to do sclerotherapy. It is a lot of information and that's why we're here. Well, depending on the lesion and the type of vascular malformation, particularly a venous malformation, sclerotherapy would be the treatment of choice. And remember, everybody, we have our free conference coming up October 6th in New York City. We still have some free hotels. You'll see Dr. Uh, Nelson in person, Dr. Weiner, um, Dr. Mim, um, all host of all experts, uh, Dr. Uh, Comey for Sturge Weber and, and KTS. So don't forget to register at birthmark.org backslash conference. Erin says her son is KT, is on in his private area, along with the tip of his penal area. How much laser in that area is too much? He's only had one laser treatment, but it's flaring up again. There's no, just because I mean, it's, the, it's the tip of the penis is not a problem. That can be treated uh, with the laser. I mean, we do lots of patients who have venous malformations, actually, of the uh, penis, which is a common problem. I mean, that area can certainly be treated uh, there's no limitation to the number of procedures that you can do there. Um, there is this one I want to pull back up for Kelly because we didn't answer her. She's 48. She doesn't know what type of birthmark she had. She had lesions on her face. She's blind in her right eye and was told it was in her throat. She's had four surgeries when she was young. 
they tried to uh, shrink the lesions. Well, what I would say, Kelly, is you need to get a magnetic resonance angiogram of your face and head and bring it to the VBF conference in New York so that the experts can look at and it. And guess what? Kelly lives in Amsterdam, New York, which is like a half hour from my house in Niskayuna, New York. So, Kelly, you can come we'll to see you the first week our, of October. Uh, our conference in New York City, and you'll get all of that answered. Just bring the images. Please bring the imaging study. Get a disc of the images and bring and it so that they can look at it. pictures when she was young. Aaron wants to know the difference between PDL and the Prima. The, PD, the Prima is a PDL laser. It's just the latest iteration or the newest device uh, from the company. Uh, the other advantage is that it has a second wavelength, the YAG laser, which we can use for deeper lesions or for vascular nodules. So it sort of helps solve two problems. Um, I've never heard this question, but Aaron Lorene, thank you for answering, asking it. Are you at risk for Bell's palsy with a port wine stain on the stainless? Well, Bell's palsy is a transient injury to the seventh cranial nerve, which is the facial nerve. Uh, I am not aware of any association between Bell's palsy and port wine stains, but it certainly, if the lesion became thicker or that there was some compression of the facial nerve, uh, that might be possible. You can also get Bell's palsy from viral infections. Okay. There's a number of different etiologies for Bell's palsy. I would suggest you have a, you know, an MRI of your brain to make sure that there's no other etiology for that Bell's palsy. Jennifer says, hi, her daughter has a large port wine on her cheek and neck. She's had seven treatments as an infant, but wanted to wait to continue until she didn't need to be put to sleep. Approximately what age would you you say that might be? It depends on the child. You know, I have four children of my own, and they're very particular, and my wife and I are very particular about them, as you, I'm sure you are your daughter, and it just depends on how cooperative the child will be. We saw a child today from San Diego who's had multiple laser procedures um, without anesthesia, and the mother told me the child has no problem with it whatsoever. Yeah, and she's it like just, 16 months. It just depends. It depends on how well you're cooperative your child is. Right, and I've heard that too. That I've heard from adults and teenagers that love it and adults and teenagers that want anesthesia so it's about the person Kelly St. Clair can it change color get darker during puberty my daughter's seems to be getting darker it stretches from her hand to her shoulder years ago we were told this could ha be, happen but since it causes her no tr real trouble we haven't had it looked at in six years well that's the classical story Kelly with any changes in puberty or growth spurts uh, pregnancy, menopause, vascular malformations will change in female patients. But based on your description of your daughter's port wine stain, I would suggest your daughter have some imaging studies just to make sure that she does not have underlying Klippeltrenone syndrome in that extremity. Um, Doris is writing in Spanish, and it's I think she's asking about if it's necessary for la a laser, and that's her plan doesn't it doesn't cover her son. For the treatment so if you can do a translation on that resubmit it doris i'm sorry or email it to linda and uh, we'll have my staff i have a lot of spanish speakers on my staff we'd be happy to uh, read it and respond exactly um oh she's from puerto rico so well she could certainly go to anna duarte in miami, miami. Yeah, very very close right um the next one from audrey says hello from minnesota my 13 month old has a vm from his cheek to his chin, including lip and chin. What is the best type of laser to treat VMs? We've done, we've done three treatments of scleral since January. Well, when you're saying VM, can you write back and tell us, are you talking about a capillary vascular malformation, which is a port wine stain, or VM, do you mean venous malformation? I think that's what she means because she so, says it's on his tongue as well. So if we need to know exactly, could you be a little bit more specific about what the diagnosis is? If it's a venous malformation on the tongue commonly, my ENT colleagues use ND YAG lasers to get deep into the tongue uh, to coagulate those deep blood vessels. And often that's done in combination with scleral therapy as well. Okay, so, um, oh, she said venous. She said it is venous. It is Audrey a venous malformation. Venous. So if you're talking about the tongue, the probably the most appropriate laser would be the ND YAG laser. And just make sure you're seeing a really good team, a multidisciplinary team with a good head and neck doctor. I mean, for the She's, vascular component, I can highly recommend Dr. Brian Zellickson, um, who's in it. She's um, said it's slow flow, so we know that. Ju Nee said, hi, Dr. Nelson. You treated our son 12 to 13 years ago. He's now gone through puberty. His port wine stain on his face does not look like it has returned, but we would like to stay on top of this, make sure no issues occur. 
if it's not very visible, is it we in the clear, or should we still have it checked out? Oh, well, as long as you're comfortable and it's not rapidly changing, I don't think there's any need for you to come in and see us. But if you do notice a change that it is insidiously and slowly getting darker over time, then it might be helpful to do one or two maintenance treatments to get him back to his baseline. Um, Jennifer says her daughter has a large port wine on her cheek and neck. She had seven treatments as an infant. Wants to wait and to continue until she can be put to sleep. No, well, we answered this question oh, okay. already. Okay, so I'm already see. I'm kind of ahead of you because well, let the questions come up. Yeah, but the, uh, this one from Treston says we see an ENT tomorrow about laser. Her stain takes up most of the left side of her. Uh, left side of her face, including the hair. One of the most important questions to ask. I'm scared they won't be knowledgeable about the stain and the best treatments to help prevent further swelling. So that's from Tristan. I'm sorry, I can't see the whole We see an ear and nose, throat, Dr. Tomorrow, tomorrow oh, laser. Side of face. Well, the questions I would ask is, you know, first of all, how, how many patients are, has that particular practice treated in pediatrics? Uh, you should probably ask questions about possibly anesthesia and when would be a good time to do that. You should ask about what laser device they are proposing to use. Do they have the latest technology? You want to make sure that they're not going to be treated with an inferior device or even in some cases devices which aren't really lasers. So I would start there and get a sort of a sense of exactly what's the experience of the team that you're seeing. Yeah, see these aren't moving. They're not moving along. But um, Kelly wants to know if her insurance sure. will cover her to get the, the MRI since I'm 48 years old. Do I need a doctor's order for You it? definitely need a doctor's order because a physician will have to order that. But you're, I mean, I just, depending on what insurance you have, uh, at least here in California, ordering a, a MRI is not a problem. Often I have to do peer-to-peer -peer reviews to get them approved, uh, but I would not anticipate that being a problem. Uh, Tristan said his daughter is five months old. That was the one that um, was asking us questions before. Jules Slingsby says, hi, Dr. Nelson. Um, Jules Slingsby, right there, mm -hmm. Jules okay. Slingsby. Uh, Audrey says, thank you kindly. I'll look into that. Uh, we greatly appreciate your time. And you're welcome to everyone who's shouting out for all the VBF Facebook Live sessions. We've proudly announced that over 120,000 people have been educated worldwide through our Facebook Live sessions. Stephanie Lynn wants to know, think of trialing general anesthesia or trying it for um, future treatments to get more accurate treatment on my toddler. If it's small area on face, how do you typically put them under, and what method do you use to put them under? Usually we do it with sevoflurane uh, for children. Uh, we do it all by mask. Um, once they become seven, eight, nine years old, uh, sometimes our anesthesiologist will at that point want to have an IV at the same time. But most of the time it's done simply by mask. Uh, we have the parent come into the operating theater with us. Uh, they're there while the child is being put to sleep by the anesthesiologist. And the anesthetic agent we use is sevoflurane, which is very, very safe for infants and young children. Um, so Aaron said, if the tongue has discoloration, would it be venous or can it be a port wine stain? Well, if usually port wine stains involve just the skin component. I mean, it would be unusual for a port wine stain to involve the tongue. So I would say the lesion is most likely either a venous or a lymphatic malformation. But that determination should be able to be made by an experienced radiologist looking at an MRI of the face and neck area. Uh, Mindy says that they see a pederm for their four months old hemangioma by his eye. He's on propranolol. It was raised when we started, but it's not now. Should we ask about switching his timolol? It depends on how aggressive the lesion is. I mean, it sounds like you're, you're fortunate your hemangioma, your daughter's hemangioma has sort of burned itself out. Uh, probably the first thing you should be talking about is weaning that propranolol. And usually the rule of thumb is that it takes 25% of the time uh, that your child was on the propranolol to actually remove it. So if your child's been on it for four months, uh, it's going to take a month to remove that. So if you see some rebound during the withdrawal, then your daughter's going to need to stay on the, the uh, propranolol. Well, that's a good answer. I, I learned something today. Tiff said, my beautiful daughter has had laser since uh, one month, oh, let me get back here so you're not scrolling on the big screen, uh, since she was six weeks and she is now 10 months, so she's had started really early. 
Um, she's had good results, especially in the temple area, but a little more stubborn on the cheek. My question is, the doctor wants to stop as she's very strong and starting to move, which is making it dangerous. He doesn't do FDA, so suggested to stop for now until before kindy age, four, and restart before school. If we don't continue and stop for a while, there's a chance all the hard work will go to waste and the poor will die. I mean, certainly it could insidiously and slowly become darker. I mean, I would, uh, I mean, this, the face is certainly the places closer to the midline, the anatomic area. So the cheek is going to be more resistant than the temple area. So I would encourage you to, you know, find a facility where you can continue the treatment, you know, with, with anesthesia and do it, as we described earlier, just by a masking procedure uh, being done with sebo flooring. Um, so, I'm sorry, I don't see the questions. Are they? Are they not scrolling? They're not. Or? It stopped scrolling. I don't know what's wrong. I have a port wine on my lip, cheek, nose, and eye. I had laser when I was a teenager. I remember it being painful. I'm now 45 and continuing going through it again. Is it still painful? And what about the healing process? Well, it's still painful, but a patient at your age should be able to be reasonably blocked using local anesthesia, where depending on exactly what size on your face somebody who's experienced doing this should be able to place nerve blocks in your face and make the procedure you know not painful for you but without the local anesthetics without the nerve blocks yes the procedure is still painful well i mean um dr geronimus is doing the free lasers at our conference this this october a lot of people have it using the numbing cream and and they seem okay i mean she hasn't had it done in a long time so with the dynamic cooling and the emlet has improved, right? The yep. pain level. But it's, yeah. it's not, but a big area would be uncomfortable. And there's yeah. no reason for it to be painful. Just the regional nerve blocks can be done very easily in the face. Oh, so um, this mom, this other mom wants to know if the, um, they should avoid the lasering near the hair. She had well, asked you another question. There's a, if you, if you radiate radiates that have hair, I let the patients, make, the parents make the decision. The problem is, is that melanin in the hair follicle will also absorb the light. And when, the, when that light is absorbed, it gets converted to heat in the hair follicle, and you're going to damage that hair follicle. The question is whether or not the hair follicle regenerate. And in large studies that have been done, about a, there's about a 20% chance of patients who develop alopecia as a result of having pulse dye laser treatment in a hair-bearing area. So we generally do not treat hair bearing areas we try and stay away from the eyebrows and other areas like that because you can induce permanent alopecia or baldness um, so another mom wants to know is there a, a, a cream that you would recommend to prevent thickening sun damage or bleeding there's no cream for uh, preventing thickening and sun damage and bleeding of a port wine stain that needs to be treated by laser but you do recommend sunscreen sunscreen yeah um, Jewel said again, heart, sorry, last message. She's in Australia. Her daughter is three and a half, has the port wine on her face. She's had eight treatments under GA. The doctor we said it, she said after tr 10, there may not be much more change ver of the results versus the risk. So she wants to know what's your opinion? Should they keep going beyond the 10th treatment? I mean, I would keep going beyond the 10th treatment, but I might space the treatments out with a little longer interval, perhaps a couple of months, as opposed to the very aggressive approach that we're using every two to four weeks in infants now. Lauren wants to know, is there any way to determine how deep a port wine stain is? No, because the blood vessels are so small, it's difficult to resolve them by ultrasound, by MRI, CAT scan. There really is no good way to determine the thickness of a port wine stain or the vessel depth. Uh, Carmen wants to know, does this laser work for the midline capillary malformation? Yes, yeah, particularly if it's over a bony prominence like the forehead, the glabella between the eyes. Uh, laser treatment works very, very well in those areas. A uh, Jew says that um, my son has a port wine on the left hand side of his face is undergoing orthodontic treatment. We are noticing asymmetric facial growth. Could this be related to the port wine? It's absolutely related to the port wine stain and that's probably why he's having the orthodontic issues because there's more blood flow on that side of the face. 
you're getting the hemihypertrophy, and that can also involve the underlying soft tissue, muscle, and bone, which could lead to the orthodontic issues. And we, by the way, at our conference in October, we have Dr. Darrow who will be doing free dental exams and checking gums and gums with port wine in the dental and gum area. So you really should try to come to our conference because it's worth it. <laughs> well, he's the leading expert in the yeah, United States. Yeah, you so get if you have an opportunity to come see Dr. David Darrow, I would take advantage of that. Right. Um, Mariah is her daughter, who is two, has a port wine on the left side, her nose, her eyelid, her left forehead, up to the scalp. She's had five, done well. Her pressure in her eye is perfect. She has seen a neurologist, and they say, say she's done well. No seizures, no developmental delays. Should she be seeing an ENT? because it's on the left side of her nose. No, I mean, the poor wine stain should just be involving the face unless there's in some kind of reason to believe that there's an issue because she's having recurrent bleeding from a nostril. No, I would not think that she needs to be evaluated by an ear, nose, and throat pus specialist. So Kenya wants to know, when is a good time to start lasering a hemangioma? Well, if we can get them when they're flat and they're small, I mean, um, you know, I would laser a hemangioma on the way from the delivery room to the NICU if I could, because one, because of the laser, if you can get those lesions immediately, sometimes one or two treatments with just a couple of pulses of the laser, that you're done. You completely remove the hemangioma, and the patient doesn't have to go on any kind of beta blocker therapy. So if you can do it when it's just a small dot, that's the best answer. Hi, Tina. Tina's just joined the group, so Tina Muscarella McGrath. Um, and um, so I'd also like to remind, okay, well, I have a question. I thought I had a break. Um, so Mary Kathleen said her son is 22 months old, has a port wine on his cheek and upper lip. We've done treatments every three weeks from five months to 12, then every three months. Up until the last two treatments, it, it was almost gone. But after the last two, two we never healed up as well and appears worse now. Is this due to growth spurts and teething or more likely redarkening? Well, it could be due to a lot of reasons. I mean, it's not unusual for patients who are having aggressive treatment that you can get an irritant dermatitis you know, of the skin. The skin can just look more red because you're doing those treatments very, very aggressively. And as I said earlier, melanin in the normal skin is going to absorb the laser light. So probably what I would say is that you might wait a couple of weeks, see if this calms down. Sometimes uh, putting patients on a mild topical steroid can help calm down, calm down that irritation. It could be due to a growth spurt as well. It could be due to redarkening, but it would be unusual for you to see that redarken immediately after the laser treatment. So I would be more suspicious that it's some kind of irritant dermatitis as a result of all the aggressive laser treatment, which should calm down on its own. Uh, Ann White wants to know if there's anyone in Canada she can talk to. She has uh, Port Wine and Sturge Weber. Well, my good friend, Dr. Harvey Louie, who's the chairman of the Department of Dermatology at the University of British Columbia, is certainly highly qualified. Um, I don't know whether you live in, in the eastern or western Canada, western Canada. Uh, but certainly Harvey Louie. Uh, Carmen wants to know who we recommend in, for laser in Texas. And we have um, Dr. Paul Friedman in Houston, who is training, has been training with Dr. Geronimus from New York for years, and maybe you know somebody else. Dr. Moises Levy, who's at Moises Dell Levy. Children's Hospital in Austin, uh -huh. is a highly experienced pediatric dermatologist who I could recommend as well. Right. Oops, sorry. Okay. Um, uh, did we answer the, do you, do you um, recommend using a laser on the inside of the upper lip? We are on propranolol for an upper lip hemangioma and one on the scalp and the hemangiomas are not responding well. My son is three months old. Well, you can certainly laser on the inside of the gum as long as you're not in the teeth bearing area. So if I've understood your question correctly, you're talking about just the inside of the cheek and that can certainly be lasered appropriately. If your child's not responding to the propranolol, you might go back and see your pediatrician or pediatric dermatologist and have them increase the dose of the propranolol. You know, sometimes generally we at our institution start at two milligrams per kilogram uh, per day in the divided doses, but certainly some patients, particularly in the parotid area, those lesions tend to be more resistant. So you might need to go up to maybe three to four milligrams per kilogram per day because those are, the lesions involve the parotid. They're more difficult to treat and they require propranolol for a longer period of time. So your child just may need a higher dose of the propranolol. So make an appointment to see your physician as soon as possible. 
uh, Kara, um, Dr. Um, Ricardo Re Respiro at the Nicholas Children's Hospital is an interventional radiologist that um, they just had a conference and a free clinic there. Um, and he does treat venous malformations. Uh, Anne wants to know why her birthmark swells sometimes. Well, it can just be, be a number of different reasons. Whatever's causing vasodilatation, it could be a temperature issue. It can also be, you know, if, if when you're when the port wine stain is on extremity, for example, and the leg is down lower, that can be the cause. Uh, the other question that I would have was, that, you know, is this a port wine stain, but actually it's an underlying venous malformation, because a, a lesion that becomes uh, larger and more dilated. Uh, those are notorious for be, being venous malformations. So I would recommend that you be seen by a physician with the appropriate expertise just to make sure you don't have an underlying venous malformation, particularly if the swelling occurs when uh, that port wine stain is on an area that's in a dependent position. Tegan has a great question. Her son has a hemangioma on his bottom. He's been on propranolol since two weeks of age, and he's eight months, and it continues to ulcerate. What can she do? Well, the propranolol should help that, but also pulse dilator. We're now getting the questions that are starting to come up. Here we go. Okay. Here we go. All right. Well. So um, you can certainly, you know, the, the, I would combine the pulse dilator with the uh, oral propranolol. The pulse dilator does stimulate the formation of granulation tissue in ulcerated hemangiomas. So I would encourage your physician to consider that synergistic approach of using both the drug and the laser. We routinely uh, treat ulcerated hemangiomas by pulse dilator at our institution. And you're experts, so make sure you're going to an expert. Um, Mariah said she knows the standard for children is to be aggressive with laser, but at one point do you stop or take a break? I leave that up to the family. I let the family make the decision when they're satisfied with the results of the laser treatment or whether they want to take a break. Often we do that during the summer months, particularly if the child has a darker skin type, when they're going to be outside and they're going to be tanned. Uh, you don't want uh, to be exposed to uh, doing laser treatments when children are tanned. So we often take a break during the summer months. Tristan wants to know if there's anybody in Nashville and what laser do they typically use on a port wine? Uh, to be honest, to be honest uh, who, who, we, we, uh, Tristan... Ashley Burt. We don't know. We don't. I don't. Know. I don't know we anybody just, honestly in um, Nashville. I mean, what I mean, what website. is? I would contact the Department of Dermatology at Vanderbilt University and ask for a referral to a pediatric dermatologist. I used to know Dr. Daryl Ellis there, but unfortunately, Daryl retired. Or good for Daryl, he retired. Hopefully, I can join him soon. Uh, Dr. Respiro will treat some adults if you contact him at Nicholas. Um, so, I know, I see. Um, Geneva said she has a three, almost four-year-old with a nasal tip. She took liquid meds, propranolol, up to 11 months, and we tried topical. It's puffy at the top, and other kids are noticing at school, is laser a possibility? Well, if it's still red, the laser is a possibility. But, but she's but saying it's purplish-blue, so then it's probably again, deep. Well, what I would be suspicious of is, is this a venous malformation of the nasal tip? You know, I would recommend that your child have a you know, magnetic resonance angiogram of their face. You know, a lot of times, just because it's red, the pediatricians immediately assume it's a hemangioma. But if this child is now almost four, and I read your email, your text correctly, you know, I would be concerned that this is an underlying venous malformation and have that checked out. Well, also, we don't know what the dose was. It could have been um, a low dose because Dr. Um, Wainers reported a lot of uh, hemangiomas of the nasal tip appear to not be responding, but the dose needs to be more aggressive, and it's very low. You know, they're using one milligram per no, kilo. No, that's just what I said. That's what I said. Patient. Yeah. The, the, the cheek hemangiomas are notorious. You have to often go up to three or four milligrams per kilogram. Right. Megan says, is laser treatment recommended or strictly for the cosmetic? We don't use that word. We don't use the word cosmetic. No. I spend a lot of my time writing letters to insurance companies arguing that these are progressive lesions, they're not cosmetic. Fortunately here in California we have a statute that was passed by the California State Assembly which defines the difference between reconstructive and cosmetic surgery and I actually will put the reference and cite for the insurance company the actual law so they can look it up. Um, so we, this would certainly not be committed to the uh, cosmetic procedure and as I can now see the rest of your text you're telling me that this involves visible. her entire right leg and she has hemihypertrophy. 
And it Megan, wasn't visible until she was yeah. 11 months old. So, and Megan, time. your child needs a, an MRA, magnetic resonance angiogram of that entire extremity and probably the pelvis too, just to make sure there's no underlying clipal trinanes. Yeah, and you should probably That's come to our conference because then you could see a whole team of doctors for free and at least get an accurate diagnosis. And it's in October. It's not that far away. But if you email me at birthmark.org backslash Dr. Linda, I can also let you know who's in your area that can give you an accurate diagnosis. And like Dr. Nelson said, you'll have to get some imaging on and um, we can give you some letters, some, some AAP guidelines to give to your pediatrician. We have a lot of good documents on our website that you can take to your primary care doctor. So we've had 97 comments. That's pretty impressive for um, 20, only 20 minutes left to go. Uh, Anne said she had laser treatments from 82 to 2002 with no results. Are the new lasers better? Oh, absolutely. I mean, if, at that time period, Anne, Number one, we hadn't invented the dynamic cooling device, so you had it. to protect. It was, it. it was in my head. It was in my head. invented it. It was in my head, but it hadn't been translated, translated and incorporated into laser technology. Plus, at that time, we only had one pulse duration of the laser that we could use. It was fixed. Now, the reason it's called V-beam means variable pulse, and that allows us to change the pulse duration of the laser exposure, which allows us to get much better results. So I would encourage you to reconsider and consider having more laser treatments or treatments. Great. And um, once again, our conference is Saturday, October 6th in New York City at the Lenox Hill Hospital. You can register at birthmark.org backslash conference. It's free if you can't afford the $100 registration fee. We waive it. You get a free night's lodging, free clinic appointment, dental exams, and you may qualify for a free laser treatment. So make sure you register before all these slots are taken. Jen McInerney said she just showed Chloe Dr. Nelson. Hi, Jen. And How are she you? asked when she can have her next surgery. She's welcome to come anytime you want. <laughs> Pretty good, Jen. When we got a little girl asking to have her lasered, we should have her Say as hi our, to PJ should, for me. We should have her as our poster child. I love it. I love it. That's a great one. Um, okay, so we we still have uh, 19 minutes to take questions. And remember, May is Vascular Birthmarks, International Month of Awareness. Make sure you put on your birthmark. Make sure you share your stories. Um, participate in our conferences and on our Day of Awareness. Become one of our global ambassadors. Um, Melissa says, is the tip of the nose a difficult area to treat? My daughter has had five treatments without good clearance um, on her nose, is it possible to get that spot? Yeah, I mean, the nose is an easy site to treat. The question is, you didn't tell us what exactly the problem was. Is it a port wine stain? Is it a trauma? You know, hopefully it's not an underlying venous malformation, as we talked about with another family. Uh, but the nose is no easy area to treat with a laser. Um, Aaron wants to know if there's any creams in trial for port wine. Well, I know... Not right now. I mean, I answered a question through the VBF website this morning. Somebody asked me about a Mikimode and Serolimus or Rapamycin. Uh, we've tested both of them. We have not found either of them to be particularly helpful, and both are extremely irritating to the skin. We're hoping to start at the end of this year, or hopefully soon, soon a new compound. I can't talk about it because I've signed a non-disclosure agreement. But we're hoping to start a new clinical study uh, with another topical agent to be used in conjunction with the pulse dye laser. And when those uh, results come out, you'll hear it first It'll at be right BBF. Here. And maybe in the fall, we'll hear something at our conference. So it's really great. So once again, remember, if you want to hear all this latest information, our conference is Saturday, October 6th at the Lenox Hill Hospital, New York City. You can register at birthmark.org backslash conference. Also, if your questions haven't been adequately answered today, you can email Dr. Uh, Nelson at birthmark.org backslash Nelson, and you can email me at birthmark.org backslash Dr. Linda. So we still have 15 minutes to take your questions, and if we haven't answered your question because it scrolled by really quickly, we are now over 100 comments that we've had in a short period of time. So if we've missed your question, or we didn't um, answer them thoroughly, please uh, restate me now. Let me see if we're missing any. Hi, Jeannie, and hi, Michael. <laughs> so um, Virginia is now here. Best way to get clearance for adult patients. I'm sorry. Virginia Wynn Jason wants to know, 
what is the best way to get clearance for adult patients? I'm so Generally, sure. for adult patients, the best way to get clearance is to use longer pulse durations of the laser and, and possibly consider using something that penetrates deep parts of skin, such as the Alexandrite. Uh, but mainly, using longer pulse durations as compared to children, I have found tends to be much more successful in adult patients. Uh, Anne wants to know if there's anyone in Toronto, even uh, though that's your hometown. No, Vancouver is oh, my Vancouver. hometown. Sorry. Vancouver Sorry. is my hometown. <laughs> um, to be honest, Anne, I don't know anybody in Toronto, but um, perhaps we could ask um, some of our colleagues to see if they're aware of anybody. Yeah, I'd like to add someone else to our, our website, but I have no one in Toronto. Ezra wants to know, if a hemangioma is removed surgically, do you think it can ever come back? I mean, there's... No, that would well, be unusual. I well, mean, unless some is left behind. But they, then they should normally involute and go away on their own anyway. So that would be extremely We're, We are rare. seeing some rebounds. We are. We do see some rebounds if it's not completely removed. But if it's completely removed, and years go by, it's not going to come back. Um, very enlightening. <laughs> Revelations are very enlightening. Um, hello, Justin. Make sure we, since we only have uh, 15 minutes left, to submit your questions. And again, everybody, these videos are saved. They're archived from when we started them back in January of 2017. So you can go back and rewatch any that you want. Aaron wants to know, can you have both a port wine and a venous malformation, or would it be one or the other? Well, you can have a port wine stain on the surface of the skin that's uh, sort of the, the tip of the iceberg to a venous malformation. So the only way to make that diagnosis is with imaging studies, namely a magnetic resonance angiogram. So usually the diagnosis is a venous malformation, which is also involving the skin. So Laura has a great question, Laura Victorinson White. Her 15-year-old has overgrowth on her lower lip. She has her port wine. She's had multiple laser, including on the lip. Is debulking surgery a possibility, and who would perform that if it's an option? Well, debulking surgery is definitely an option. It just needs to be done by somebody who's highly experienced because knowing how much tissue to remove in these cases can be often be very, very difficult. So it needs to be done by an experienced you know, facial plastic surgeon who has a lot of experience doing these procedures. But lip debulking surgery can certainly be done. And we, we know who they are, Laura, so you can email me or message me, and we can let you know and give you some re resources in the U.S. If you're in the U.S., if you're outside the U.S., we're, we have limited resources, but we do have more here in the U.S. Um, Bree wants to know, does laser treatment cause headaches? It doesn't. The laser that's not specifically going to cause headaches, but certainly sometimes even at the end of the day, if I haven't had my glasses exactly per, and I'm going to have a headache because you can get some light will be highly scattered by scattered by skin. And so it's certainly possible, uh, I believe, that you may just have been getting a little bit of light, you know, unfortunately into your orbit. And uh, yeah, I, I believe that, yes, it can cause headaches, but it's transient. So it'll clear right up. Uh, Laura again said, thank you. We're coming to the conference in New York. Woo! Well, we're looking forward to meeting you. Yay. Good job. And you're gonna, if you're coming to New York, you're going to see those experts in the debulking surgery that we talked yes, about. Yes, the lip wall. There will be three lip surgeons there, three experts. So Just make sure that you write down uh, that you want lip hypertrophy consultation for surgical reduction. I, I review every picture and just make sure you put down what you know what you're looking for and I'll make sure you get into every appointment that you need. I personally review every single image that comes in for our conference so that I make sure every patient sees every doctor. There'll be seven teams, two port wine stain teams, a hemangioma team, venous malformation, KT, and Serge Weber team. So there's plenty of teams and if you need to see multiple teams, we'll let you do that as well. It's quite an amazing experience to have 125 clinic appointments in a five-hour period during this conference. And, the, and if I haven't already said this, we have free daycare, we have psychotherapy sessions, we have a free makeup session. If you have a port wine stain on your face, you can have a free make, makeup expert cover that and let you see what it would look like covered. Um, so Thomas wants to know, is there any physical therapy to deal with... Um, okay, I missed it. Is there any... Uh, to deal with KTS pain? KTS pain. No. 
Okay. okay. Thomas, Thomas and Daniela Garcia, is there any yeah. physical therapy to deal with KTS pain? Yeah. The single most important thing that you can do, and I learned this from Martin Mim, is swimming. And Dr. Linda in Boston. <laughs> if, you, yeah. if you want to take credit, that's fine. Yeah. I was not Stuart Nelson. The single most important thing you can do is start swimming. Mm -hmm. That kicking motion to mobilize the musculature around the blood vessels that are abnormally dilated is the single best thing you can do, you can do TS pain. It stimulates so. circulation. We have a, a sheet, a fact sheet on our website at birthmark.org under the KTS picture that tells you all the things you can do. Um, I wrote it with Dr. Delphinian and it has the water therapy. Um, some recommend taking a baby aspirin, you know, to keep it keep clotting. So, and then if you come to our conference, you'll see the KTS experts. So, it's all good. It's all uh, Tracy says her 11-month-old has a hemangioma on his neck across the whole front of her neck. She's been on propranolol for it since about two months after it ulcerated. I think I remember communicating with you, Tracy. The propranolol worked great. It's shrinking. It's shrinking. Her dermatologist said we will start weaning her off at age one. Does laser help the sagging skin from it growing and ulcerating, or should we see it, see if... As she gets older, it gets better. I would wait. I would say wait, 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 Tracy. The laser, laser, it will help. The laser will help for residual redness. But that excess saggy skin, I think it's just going to take the tincture of time that as your 11-month-old uh, child becomes larger, I think a lot of that will become not noticeable at all. She'll grow into that sagging sag. So don't let anybody surgically cut that out. Wait, 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 wait. Um, and Tracy, if it's not your daughter, I've seen a lot of uh, the um, neck hemangioma areas that have been ulcerating lately, and I think we should start maybe collecting some data because they are really persistent with the propranolol. Uh, Barbara Byron said, about the debulking the lip area, would it be covered by insurance or considered cosmetic? It should be covered by insurance. Your mm -hmm. physician who is proposing to do this needs to write a good letter that makes the arguments for why this is reconstructive surgery as opposed to cosmetic surgery. And that surgery. it's a progressive tumor, and we do have samples of letters on that. Mariah said, I didn't ask the question correctly, but how many laser treatments does it take to be considered treatment? I know it differs on the individual and the site. But I want to make sure that my daughter won't be later. I mean, when families come to test, see me, I tell them it's probably going to be five to ten laser treatments to really see significant fading, and perhaps later on they are going to need some kind of maintenance program. It really depends on the type of, of port wine stain, the anatomic location. Uh, those are all different variables, and it's often very difficult to tell a family exactly how many laser treatments are going to be required. But she may need to have some kind of ongoing treatment, you know, perhaps one or two treatments a year, a year at least as we stand, as we sit here today, May 2018. Um, so Hiroko says his 14-year-old son has a port wine on the left side. They've had six treatments when he was an infant with three-month intervals. They'll resume, resume next month, and the doctor suggests one-month interval, but because of school activities and travel from Laos to Bangkok, Thailand, they make it impossible. How the treatment interval, I just can't get this to scroll. Oh, there it is. How the treatment interval will affect the result of treatment. Well, in, uh, I don't know who you're seeing in Bangkok, but I can highly recommend one of my former fellows, Dr. Neom Tantakan, who's in Thailand. Uh, it depends on uh, if your child is 14, the treatments don't need to be done as aggressively. So if there is going to be an interval of several months between the treatments, if your child's gone through puberty, probably waiting a little bit longer, I wouldn't be concerned about that. And just try and get him in there when you can. I understand going from Laos to Bangkok can be an adventure. There's a monetary cost to doing this. So I would not, in a 14-year-old, it's not going to make as big a difference as it's going to make in a child or an infant. Um, Virginia says she's having um, having maintenance every other month isn't helping her. It's getting thicker and nodules, and she's trying to get her insurance to send her to you. Um, beyond that, what can I push them or tell them to do that can help? Well, certainly for the nodules, using the deeper penetrating alexandrite or the new YAG that's going to be part of the Prima system, uh, that should keep the nodules from flattening and smoothening out. 
But if you're having nodules, you know, I would tell your insurance company that you're having problems with bleeding, and that's a medical necessity. I mean, I'll put that in an, a letter to their insurance company that the patient told me they're having bleeding, that this is a medical emergency, that patient needs to be treated, and when somebody, when you put that into a letter, you're going to get that insurance company to cover that procedure. Um, it's not scrolling again, but... Are you rolling the... I don't know. You there it is, have, yep. You have better... You oh, roll it. Okay, I'm trying. Okay, uh, so we're... Ann says right here, Ann White. Oh, just, okay, go, go, move. <laughs> well, we'll use the roller. Uh, okay. Ann, Ann White said her birthmark affects the nerves in, in my face and causes severe pain. Is there anything I can do? Well, I would, you should have some imaging studies done of your brain. I mean, that's an unusual complaint uh, associated with a port wine stain or a birthmark. So I would just make sure that there's no underlying uh, etiology for that pain. Well, it could be a, a, a venous inflammation, right? Yeah. Okay, well, we'll try in here. Uh, Alexandra says, just tuning in, can you discuss laser on darker skin versus lighter? Should an African-American infant wait until his or her skin colors come in before starting treatment or start as soon as possible? I would start as soon as po possible, Alexandra, if I'm reading your, uh, pronouncing your name correctly, because the epidermal melanin is going to only become darker over the course of time. Uh, we do treat African-American patients here at Beckman. I know Roy Geronimus in New York treats a lot of African-American patients. You just have to have the family observe strict sun precautions using sunscreens. Uh, because you want that skin to be as white as possible. You've got to be more conservative with the laser treatment. Uh, you can't use as high energy densities, otherwise you'll permanently de depigment the skin. Uh, between the treatments, you'll probably notice that the skin is going to become a lot lighter because of that melanin absorption. So I would encourage you to start the treatment as soon as possible because the melanin concentration and density is density. going to be becoming a more difficult uh, problem to deal with later on. Later and um, for everybody's sake, what was the name of that uh, sunscreen you say everybody, all the doctors recommend? Well, all my dermatology uh, colleagues recommend Elta MD UV Clear. And my wife and I use it because both of us are very allergic to sunscreens. They're full of chemicals. Uh, this one is this one, hypoallergenic. And uh, all my dermatology colleagues use it and my wife and I use it. How do you spell it? Elta, E-L-T-A MD UV ultraviolet clear. Okay. And you can you. buy it on the internet. So we only have um, less than five minutes, but we have four minutes left. And um, okay. And I think that was the last question that we had from Ann White. Um, if, you, if you tuned in late, you can go back and rewatch this. Lots of great, important information in here. Um, studies are, are going on all over the place. I'm going to be going to. ISFA, the International Society for the Study of Vascular Anomalies meeting in Holland, Amsterdam on Monday. Monday. I'll be there for five days. If anybody's there, um, wants to come and see me. Um, but I will hopefully be bringing back a lot of new and good information to share with all of you. So um, we've got two and a half minutes left to answer any questions. You're very welcome to all of you that are thanking us and that are thanking us for these Facebook Live sessions. We have a number coming up. We're going to be doing a session on extremity lesions with Dr. Rosen. I'm trying to pin down a time this summer. Dr. Comey and I will be also doing another session sometime in either around August on Sturge Weber syndrome. And um, you can just keep tuning in to our Vascular Birthmarks Foundation Facebook page to when the next one will be. Also, I personally share it on 30 to 50 different Facebook groups. So if you saw this posted on your group, that's probably because I shared it, <laughs> because I create the post to share to all of the smaller and larger groups, like the Port Weinstein group in, in the United Kingdom, the Sturge Weber group in Ireland, uh, Port Weinstein Proud, um, Birthmark Buddies, uh, Hemangioma Awareness, there's a Hemangioma Treatment to Treat or Not to Treat. There's, um, like I said, there's over 40 or 50 different vascular birthmark groups on Facebook. I try to identify them all so that I can publish that we're going to be having these very, very important Facebook Live sessions. And again, they stay on our YouTube channel at birthmark.org. They're also on our website at birthmark.org and they are they stay right here 
on our VBF Facebook page. So you can scroll all the way back to uh, January of 2017 when we started them. So they're, they're always available for you to go back and re-listen and ask questions again and see what Dr. Nelson or Dr. Weiner or Dr. Geronimus or one of our other experts had to say. So we have less than 30 seconds and um, thank you all for participating in May is Vascular Birthmarks Month of Awareness. Please make sure you get the word out, not just to tell the story of VBF, but to tell your story. Raise awareness in your community, in your city, in your state, in your country, because so many places around the world do not have access to the care that Dr. Nelson provides and the expertise that he provides. But the more we raise awareness and bring our I team around the world to train doctors, the more doctors are becoming experts, and we're really proud about that. So thank you, Dr. Nelson, for You're joining welcome. us thank today. Thank you for all the questions. And thank you all, and we will see you soon. Yeah. Enjoy your uh, Memorial Weekend, and be safe.